Today we are having Aya Santachitta, if you don't know her. Um, she is uh, originally from Austria and a nun since over 30 years, now living in USA. And Aya, thank you very much for uh, coming to Ankampa community and uh, uh, doing this Dhamma talk. Um, I'll give it to you, Aya, now. Thank you so much, Manori and Matthias, you know, for hosting the session. And hello, everyone. I knew a know a few people. I know Shirley from Amaravati Times, and know Debs also. She comes to my Wednesday online teachings. And hello, lovely to see you all. As uh, Manori said, you know, I am a nun for over thirty years, and. Many, many years ago, I met Aya Chanda at uh, Amaravati Buddhist Monastery in Hertfordshire. And since then, you know, we have been on and off in contact. She also came to stay with us at our monastery in California. And, you know, since about two years, I'm living now at the Aloka Earth Room in San Rafael. That's uh, close to the north end of the Golden Gate Bridge. And at this point, you know, in time, I'm mostly interested in bringing together the uh, early Buddhist teachings with earth-based teachings. And that's what I'm going to offer today. So I'd like to start, you know, with just five minutes settling in. You know, sensing your body sitting in your room, on a chair, on a cushion, on the ground, and breathing in and breathing out. aware of the weight of the body, the, the gravity which gently pulls us to the ground, the soil underneath where we are sitting. And arriving after a full day, Evening, things are slowing down. Whatever has come before today, like a birthday party or work or just a lovely open weekend, it's all in the past now. There might be still some, you know, repercussions in the nervous system and they can be noted. And at the same time, you know, you can be aware of what brought you here today. What's your motivation for practice? And just making that conscious as well. And then embodying that motivation in the way you're sitting here how you're participating here and you're helping to create that uh, holding space for the Dhamma to come forth. So and the title, you know, which I have uh, given today is a uh, reflection 
or recollection of the Buddha and touching the earth. And uh, you know, we have a set of four meditations, which is called the four protective meditations. And I've chosen two out of this set of four, which I want to combine today and share with you. And the four protective meditations, all of those four, you know, we can find them in the suttas, but the set of four was put together later in about the 5th century uh, Christian era in Sri Lanka, most likely. And they are called protective meditations because they were protecting us from unwholesome mind states. And they reinforce wholesome qualities in the mind, which are essential, you know, for the path. And then, you know, according to what's needed, we can apply them like a remedy, you know, for a bodily ailment. We know what the illness is, and then we can apply the medicine and the same with those uh, four protective meditations because they guard the mind from negativity and they are kind of a preventative. And I'm going to just mention them in the traditional order. The first two show us the potential of the human mind and the last two show us the limitations of a human life. And they are all together, there are four realities of a human life. The first two elevate and the other two help us to let go of attachments. And they bring some more peace and balance in our lives, helping us, you know, to let go of old patterns and allowing the coming in of the unmanifest, opening the mind, creating space. The first one is a recollection of the Buddha, which I will speak more about today. The second one is meditation on metta, which you already know, I'm quite sure. The third one is practices on the body, asuba, the non-beautifulness of the body, showing us the other side of the body. And I'm going to uh, speak to that today as well in regards to the elements. And the fourth one is recollection of death. So those are the four protective meditations, and we're going to do two of them today. And they are not, you know, protective in the sense of being a talisman because they don't protect us from problems, but they give us a way how to meet and relate to so-called problems. And, you know, being able to see obstacles are the way. They are not in the way, but they are the way because there's constantly something happening. And what we can train in is to become more courageous, confident, practical, and skilled in meeting those so-called obstacles so that we learn from them and mature and grow. And these meditations, you know, they show us what is true and what is possible. So, you know, the meditation or recollection on the Buddha kind of uplifts the mind and shows us the possibilities because the Buddha was a human being just like us and he perfected you know, the potential of the human mind. And when we are taking refuge in the Buddha or when we kind of paying homage to the Buddha, then actually we are relating to our own potential for awakening. It's not about, you know, somebody out there who will rescue us, but it's more realizing that we have the same potential as the Buddha has had and the Buddha has developed it to full blossoming and has left us a teaching so we can do the same thing as he did. So that's the 
recollection of the Buddha, have more confidence in our own capacity and overcoming fear of meeting obstacles, so-called obstacles. Then, you know, the second one, the meditation on metta is like basically an antidote to anger and a way to create more and more spaciousness also in the mind. Helps us to open the heart and the mind to embrace what is. The third one, asuba, means a. Ah, super means non-beautiful. And helps us to understand, you know, that the body isn't like a separate thing, a separate entity, but the body consists of many, many parts and is in constant exchange with the body of the planet through eating, drinking, breathing, going to the bathroom, sweating, crying. You know, we never ever cut the umbilical cord towards the planet. And, you know, the body can be seen as a riding animal for consciousness so that consciousness, you know, can have a human experience and grow and learn and develop through that. So what's called the precious human birth. And uh, also shows us, you know, the limitations because the body, the human body is very vulnerable and extremely dependent on the biosphere. It is part of the biosphere. And we need to learn to realize that more fully. And then the last one is the recollection of death, which you know traditionally gives us a sense of urgency and protects us from heedlessness. And that's you know when the body returns back to the earth, when you know the life energy you know has basically exhausted itself and the body goes back into the earth. And it's the cutting edge really of impermanence practice. So that's those four protective meditations. And uh, now I'm going to speak a little bit more to the two I've chosen. So Buddhanusati, the recollection on the meaning of the qualities of the Buddha. That meditation is based on a on a chant, which is which some of you might have heard. It's called Itipiso. It you know lists the nine qualities of the Buddha, and I just uh, have chosen three of those nine qualities because you know we don't have such a long time today together, and I could just you know chant the chant one time so you can hear it, and and then go through the qualities, the three qualities which we will use for the meditation. <clears throat> so itipiso means so he is. And then it, it lists the qualities in Pali. Itipiso bhagavarahang samma sambuto Vicha charana sampano sukato loka vitu anuttaro purisatamma sarati sata deva manusana uto bhagavati. So that's this list of the nine qualities. And uh, Arahang is the first one and simply means, you know, somebody who is completely purified, has let go of all of the defilements, greed, hatred, and delusion. So the meaning is complete purity. And then the next word is Samma Sambuto, which, you know, means perfectly fully awakened without a teacher someone who fully understands the Dhamma and that 
Sama Samputo stands for complete wisdom. And then the Vichacharana Sampano means perfect knowledge and understanding and also conduct and virtue. And then Sugato means well gone, means, you know, he has gone the Noble Eightfold Path completely. And then Lokavidu means knower of the world. Someone you know who has seen the world, all realms, internally and externally. Externally in terms of, you know, the different realms where we can take rebirth and internally, meaning, you know, the five aggregates, the six sense spaces. So those five internal qualities make the Buddha a reliable teacher. And then we have also four external qualities, how the Buddha interacts with others and why he is a good teacher and guide for others. The first one is uh, Anuttaro Purisadama Sarati. That means unsurpassed teacher or unsurpassed trainer for people who want to be trained, not for people who don't want to be trained. So meaning, you know, he really understands everyone's capacity and can exactly say the right thing, you know, that that person gets uplifted in some way. So it was a perfect guide in that sense. And then we have Sata Deva Manusanang, means that he was not only teacher of human beings, but also of heavenly beings, Devas. They also came, you know, for teachings. And in some traditions, they also say, you know, that the animals came for teachings. And then the next word is Bhutto, which simply means awakened one, but can also mean awakener of beings, you know, somebody who awakens others. And then the last one is Bhagawa, which simply means, you know, blessed one or holy one and is still used today you know in India for some of the uh, you know awakened ones there they are addressed Bhagavan and uh, in the canon itself you know the word Buddha isn't used very much but it's the word Bhagava which is used in the Pali and that simply means you know that he has fulfilled the, all the other qualities we were mentioning based on his great compassion. Uh, countless lifetimes, you know, he has been developing the parameters and we know there's the Chattaka's tales, you know, which tell us of the different lifetimes. So that's complete compassion. And then when we do the meditation, we just use those three and we try, you know, to combine it with a little visualization if that works for you. Complete purity, you know, and seeing as if the Buddha would stand in front of us, you know, trying to have the sensing his presence, his face, the, the complexion of his face, the, the purity. That's the first one, Arahang. The next one is Sama Samputo, complete wisdom, seeing his eyes, you know, seeing the confidence and fearlessness in his eyes. And then the last one, Bhagava, complete compassion, you know, seeing his feet, he was walking for over 40 years, you know, after his awakening through India to teach. Sometimes he would go somewhere where there was only one person ready, you know, to break through. So the compassion, so the face, complete purity, the eyes, complete wisdom, the feet, complete compassion. And then in the meditation, we're just going to, you know, like a mantra, repeat, repeat, repeat. It's like a samadhi practice, you know. And then see, you know, how the mind responds. Probably the mind will respond by getting calm and opening. And then, you know, noticing that and continuing on with that spaciousness, limitless space. And then also 
in the end coming to back to the ground, you know, coming back to the earth. Because the human body, also the body of the Buddha, has emerged out of the planet through the mediation of a mother and is held alive, you know, by eating, drinking, breathing, and so forth. What it's only or everything offered, you know, by the planet. And then seeing, you know, that this very humble, precious human birth of a body, just like ours, you know, can be perfected through the practice into a mind like a Buddha. You know, he had inconceivable influence, you know, on millions of people still today, you know, on this planet. Even he passed away over 2,500 years ago. He lived in Iron Age, India. So imagine the power of that mind. And for a moment, you're imagining our mind would be perfected to that degree. And this unbroken chain of transmission, you know, which has been passed down and now given to us at this point. And we do the best we can with it and pass it on. So maybe let's just start with the meditation now and uh, find a posture. Maybe, you know, uh, imagining for a moment that the Buddha is standing in front of you now. Or if you want, you can have a look at a Buddha statue if you have one on your shrine. Imagine this is a, a being who has completely eliminated all greed, ill will, and delusion from the mind to never arise again, permanent. Is fully purified and liberated from samsara. Has completely, you know, uh, manifested the greatest potential of the human mind. Just, you know, taking in the face, the, the purity of the complexion, arahang, complete purity. And then taking in the eyes, Sama, Sambuto, complete wisdom. Seeing the confidence and the fearlessness. Bhagawa, complete compassion. Seeing the feet, you know, which carried the Buddha for over 40 years through India walking the Ganges Valley walking to support others.
great compassion, complete compassion. All of those qualities he has fulfilled based on that motivation. And then coming again back to the face, arahang, complete purity. And then meeting his eyes, Sama, Sambuto, complete wisdom. Bhagawa, complete compassion, seeing the feet which carried him through India, half, almost half a century. Everything was done by walking. Arahang, complete purity. Sama, Samputo, complete wisdom. Bhagawa, complete compassion. Arahang, complete purity. Sama Samputo, complete wisdom. Bhagawa, complete compassion. Arahang, complete purity. And, you know, allowing those concepts to, to sink in and, uh, you know, resonate with the mind, with the heart, with the chitta. Noticing, you know, how the mind settles down. Becomes more stable.
Arahan, complete purity. Sama Sambuto, complete wisdom. Bhagawa, complete compassion. And you know, noticing, you know, how the mind responds to those concepts as a support for stilling the mind. and the spaciousness of the mind. And I'm being aware of that uh, spaciousness, which doesn't end at the walls of the room where you're sitting in. The limitless mind. And, you know, with the out letting go into that spaciousness.
And then, you know, letting go of the spaciousness and becoming aware of that which knows about the spaciousness. Letting go of the object and the subject, so to say, you know, being aware of itself. Like making a, a U-turn and the subject being conscious of knowing. And also not letting go of the identification with the knowing as me or mine, just knowing. And that is the refuge in Buddha, the knowing, awareness. Like a mirror which uh, effortlessly reflects whatever appears in front of it. That's that quality of knowing. The refuge in Buddha. The potential which we all know from our own experience. And the practice is about strengthening that capacity to come back to the knowing rather than becoming what is known. That is the refuge in Buddha. And resting as that. And, you know, having used the mantra in the beginning, simply as the portal into that.
So you want the capacity to develop that potential depends on having a human body. And this human body has emerged out of the planet through the mother, you know, who has, uh, you know, lent us her body to grow our own body inside of her. So seeing, you know, that very lofty, amazing potential, it has very humble roots just coming out of the earth. So now, you know, bringing our awareness back into the body. And with the out press, you know, sending sending down some roots into the ground underneath where we are sitting to the soil. And with the in-breath, you know, breathing up some of that stability and vastness of the body of the earth. And, you know, experience ourselves as a bridge between those two dimensions, the manifest and the unmanifest. And knowing, you know, this body consists of earth element, which we, you know, take in through eating. And the earth element in the body, in the bones, the teeth, the nails, the hair, is exactly the same earth element as the earth element in the rocks and the mountains. And if we stop eating for one or two months, the body collapses. The water element, the body consists over 70% of water element. And the water element in the fleshy parts of the body soft parts of the body is exactly the same water element as the water element in the rivers and the lakes, the oceans and the rains. And if we don't take in water element for five to seven days, the body is going to shut down. We are totally dependent on what the biosphere provides to keep those bodies going. The fire element comes from the sun and from the center of the planet because these bodies can only live in a certain temperature range. Then the air, wind element, Oxygen coming to us through the mediation of the plant life on this planet. As you know, as the plants do the photosynthesis in order to build their bodies, the side product is oxygen of that process, and it's vital for us, for all mammalian many other animals to have that.
So seeing this deep, deep, deep interconnectedness, and the Buddha, you know, was aware of that. In the night of his awakening, he touched the earth and called her to be his witness that he had done his job, that he had done what it took, you know, to develop that deep understanding, the complete purity, complete wisdom, and complete compassion. And, you know, these bodies of ours, they have been developed on this planet for millions of years, like about two million years since the species Homo is evolving. It's a very complex Amazing, uh, sophisticated biocomputer. And, you know, which is now receiving an update about the way, you know, we are deeply. interwoven with the existence of the planet. We are not separate. And we are part of this living intelligent process we call Earth. And we need to participate in a different way now. As we are reaching the limits of what the biosphere can tolerate. So there's an additional uh, investigation now which needs to be added about how to live in harmony with the limitations of the biosphere. In terms of right livelihood. And, you know, taking only that which is given. So bringing in an other element, which was not an issue in Iron Age India, but now it has become one. So bringing in, you know, a contemplation which affects our perception of what it means, you know, to live as a human being on a planet at this time in history. And so there's, you know, becoming part of the immune system of the planet and peeling away that uh, stuckness, you know, and old perceptions, which no longer hold true. They've changed.
So in seeing another Buddha was realizing the highest potential of the human mind, that at the same time he was very practical and pragmatic and grounded, you know, living outside a lot, walking a lot, being born under a tree, you know, re re realizing awakening under a tree and uh, passing away under a tree. So he was very deeply connected with nature. And now, you know, those circumstances call us to pay attention. And to continue, you know, our inheritance and also taking in the elements which have changed since Iron Age India. You know, as we are standing on the shoulders of our ancestors, you know, being passed down this teaching over 2,500 plus years to us today. And we are handing it on to future generations. But they also need a place to live, a planet which is livable, is also part of what we need to take an interest in, how to do that. Out of compassion, And, you know, allowing that question to be there and walking with that question and becoming the answer by holding the question. And knowing, you know, that we are not alone, we are part of a living intelligent earth. And we can open ourselves to information. The self-regenerative intelligence of the planet can teach us. Because we have all of the same ingredients as the planet, we are deeply interwoven. So slowly we're going to come to the end of the practice and like a journey to the limits of the mind and then going down, back down into where we are coming from, this planet Earth. And in a moment, I'm going to ring the bell and then, you know, slowly coming back into the room without, you know, losing connection to the body. And taking in, you know, with whom you are here in the room on this journey, you know. We are not alone. We are doing this together. And we have like about 20 minutes or so. If any one of you would like to share something or maybe clarify something.
You can just unmute yourself if you like and please take your time. If you can raise the hand, I can unmute you. Okay, thank you. That's good. Surely. Thank you, Aya, for that uh, really lovely meditation. I, I've been quite agitated all weekend and my meditation's been sort of watching agitation and it's just able to sort of open up and calm down. Uh, so thank you. Uh, and... Um, thank you for the, the, the meditation on the Buddha I very rarely do. I, I know I did those meditations when I did the retreat with you at Guy House online with Laura Bridgman and we did the same things and it was yeah. really good to do them again. So that is a reminder of sort of, because uh, I'm not really a faith person, but it was a, it was a reminder that the, the, the way you sort of made the heart and the mind open up with the recollection on the Buddha and then coming back to earth. But what really interested me was, I mean, I do love the four elements meditation and, you know, that's why I come, you know, on a Wednesday evening because this is the, the this connectivity, this beautiful sort of connectivity we have with the, with the, with the biosphere which you talk about so eloquently. And I've always loved the Four Elements Meditation, even before I heard the one you did. I think last year with um, with, with Anna Camper, which yeah. was really, really profound. And, and I started coming when I could to your Wednesday evenings. Um, but I was very interested that you called it in a super practice because I don't like the, you know, I like the, elements meditation i don't like the 32 parts of the body you know it's not something that really attracts me and sort of feeling the sort of repulsive nature of the body is not something that attracted me so i was very interested that you said you described the four elements as an asupa because it doesn't i mean it yes it brings about a certain detachment from this body because you realize that this body isn't really a thing it's just a process that's constantly changing and constantly dependent in interdependent and just flowing um but that can be quite i find it quite uplifting i found it quite um this sort of connectivity it feels that yes i i belong in this in, in a way I, I, I sort of belong in this. I'm part of this, this whole system. I'm sort of not alone. And yeah. that, that's a really lovely feeling. And um, it doesn't seem... I mean, so I'm interested why you described it as a super. Um, mm -hmm. But I suppose it does, stop, it does stop clinging to this body. And also yeah. there's an awareness... Sorry, I'm sort of covering quite a lot of things. But there's also the awareness actually also of the fragility of the body and the whole ecosystem which can bring up a sense of sadness or urgency so i'll stop there and maybe you could make some comments yeah. you, so you know you know asuba it is strictly speaking as i said you know they always say that because asuba doesn't say anything about repulsiveness or anything that's just a later addition yeah. patriarchal probably you know where the Basically, you know, the monks needed something, you know, to deal with their sexuality, I suppose, you know, and then it was, there was some aversion in it, I suppose, if it's called repulsiveness, but according to the teaching, it's just called non-beautiful, you know, mm -hmm. because we, we tend to have that uh, projecting of beauty, you know, on if we see the body from the outside, but then if you cut it open and look from the inside, 
it's not necessarily repulsive or, you know, but it is certainly not super attractive, you know. And the same is with if you see the body consisting of like a heap of earth, you know, a little bit of water mm. uh, and, you know, a fire, that's not something to, strictly speaking, call beautiful, you know. So it's not about repulsiveness. That's just like something, you know, which was probably used for young monks, you know, who struggled a lot with uh, sexual lust, which is understandable, you know, and that was a way to help them, but it all it backfired also to a certain extent, you know, then really believing in the repulsiveness and blaming the women. I mean, there's monast there, I've seen things in the monasteries in Thailand, you know, paintings of women fully, you know, all over with fish hooks, you know, on their bodies everywhere and all kinds of really weird stuff, you know, blaming the women and not taking responsibility and then calling it repulsive, you know, just because that would maybe help, you know, but I think it, because it's not true, it doesn't really help. I think mm -hmm. it's a, uh, it's culturally conditioned approach, you know, which is a bit outmoded these days. So call it what it, what it means, not beautiful, you know, and that's, that's a different take on it. And, and I put that with the Asuba practice because I think the body, you know, in the first, uh, first, tet first um, establishment of mindfulness, there's these three meditations, body parts, mm. and recollection of death, you know, and they all meet that they're all different facets of looking at the body. Yeah. yeah. That's, and you're right, I mean, strictly speaking, it's not a Asuba practice, but I think in a way it's three facets of a Asuba practice, how I see it, you know. But there is a sort of beauty in the interconnectedness in a way. Absolutely. Um, I mean, is that is that? Do you think that's skillful to contemplate the beauty, even though yeah. it's fragile? And, yeah. uh, but it is. I mean, I think it is a, also a, a, a um, the whole idea is also to um, to 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 cut through the illusion of um, of selfhood. Yeah. No, but I think the beauty helps you know to uplift and create space and joy and so on. And then if there's that spaciousness, then there is more capacity to observe, you know, the fragility of it as well, you know, and then there is, there is a turning away, you know, in that sense, not a turning away, in, oh, this is also terrible, but it's more turning away, you know, I don't, I don't want to interfere with this whole thing because, you know, it's, we, we cannot wrap our mind up around it you know but what we can we can we can uh, participate in it you know but not taking charge thank you so much thank you thank you thank you Shirley it's lovely to see you again good to see you yeah yeah and then Susanne hello hello yeah I really enjoyed the meditations um I have a question about the um, first one, um, you were, you know, we were feeling the, the vastness, uh, of the space kind of, and then you said, now be aware of, uh, the one who, who knows this. Yes. And, um, and I have uh, lately in the meditations, I didn't quite get there in this meditation, but I, uh, I just had these experiences lately. Um, I think twice where I was, uh, fully in um how can i explain this? in the one who is you you said it, the one who knows i would say the one who like in my mind i was there was it completely i wasn't looking outside at anything mm -hmm. i was and it was yeah. very great feeling Con uh, you know, conscious knowing you mean conscious knowing you know okay so what um uh, do you think it's the same that i'm explaining right now that you mean i think so you know i mean i'm speaking from the you know it's like the take of the, the the forest tradition, you know, which is, they call it the one who knows or the puru, you know, in, in Thai. But I think, 
I think it's the, you know, resting as the knowing rather than uh, holding or, you know, wanting or not wanting what is known. You understand the difference? You know, there's there's the yeah, knowing. Yeah, yeah there's no, nothing to be known. And it's just it. Yeah, yeah and objects which are known. Yeah, and one the, no more object, actually. Yeah, when you drop the object, mm -hmm. you know, there, there is the subject. That's me. Up. I mean, whatever. So, I feel as like me. In, the in, in it, it's an identification, you know, and then that is also dropped. And yes, then, that's, that's, uh, is that the next step or is it also in that experience? That's that, being yeah, dropped? that's the next step. And then it's just the knowing, resting as the knowing without being it or owning it or, you know. Mm. But I think what you were saying, uh, I think you're already experiencing that, you know, and it's not like, it's not uh, anything special. It's, it's so natural that it's so close, you know, that the way how it's described, like by many different teachers in many different books, in many different ways, we start to think it's something, you know, far away from us and unreachable, but actually it's the most natural yeah uh, way of being yeah okay so and um what kind of views does the i mean i for me it felt like oh wow finally i'm just um like there's just joy and bliss and ah nothing to do or i don't know how to explain it, but yeah. so then i come out of it and almost like the first time i was like sad like oh my god i'm back in this body <laughs> didn't feel good but then the second time it was all right. But so what is the, like, what do I, what does it help me with to experience that? Or Yeah, okay. I, I was actually speaking to that in the meditation, but I'm happy to say it again. You know, if you experience the knowing, that's also an, a different word of, of uh, what the refuge in Buddha is, you know? So we can, you know, if anger arises in the mind, in the knowing, you know, if anger arises, we can know anger has a reason. We don't need to identify with the anger and then become angry. You know what I mean? But we can know that anger is there. Mm -hmm. And if it has a reason, then it naturally will also cease at one point. And we don't need to necessarily interfere with it, you know, because mm -hmm. we usually have a tendency if a strong emotion arises, let's say anger, greed, jealousy, fear, or so on, you know, we tend to become it, you know, because the energetic experience is painful and we want to do something about it, you know. Mm -hmm. When it's we're just going to say something and discharge energy, you know. Mm -hmm. If it's a very strong wanting, we're just going to put it towards us and hope the energy pattern, you know, goes away. Mm -hmm. So it's it's... To, to develop the refuge of knowing of Buddha to that extent by by abiding in it again and again, like you just did maybe two times or something, you know, and then that the confidence in that we can know this to be impermanent mm -hmm. becomes so strong, you know, that we are more and more capable of sitting out the most intense emotional triggers, mm -hmm. you know. That's that's why we do this. Okay. And this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Uh -huh. So it's not about, you know, uh, Susanna, it's not about escaping into this wonderful whatever, but it's about living here in that thing, you know, that body, mm. and having such confidence in the refuge of knowing that whatever triggers us, we have increasingly more and more capacity mm. to allow what it is without interfering, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, and sometimes things need to be done and said and so on, but not from that triggered place, you know, because that's not going to be good. Yeah. Yeah, because for me it felt like well, when I was in that, I was like, "There's, I don't need anything. Like, there's, there's just satisfaction in this being that." Yeah. And, 
yes. we think that I'm I'm not satisfied with this because I try to get something from from the out like from the outside. Maybe that makes me angry. I don't get it, but really, um, it's not. Uh, yeah, it's it's kind of less less of looking for it in the wrong place. Kind of yeah. maybe it, yeah. yeah. It's subtle, you know, the subtle joy of the open mind, which doesn't want anything, you know? Yeah. The mind in those moments where the mind doesn't want anything, all wishes are fulfilled for that moment, you know? Mm. Yeah. And to taste that, you know, many times, many times, so that even if you triggered, you remember, you know? Okay. Because you have been there and then you remember what it how it feels like when you're triggered and then there's the alarm bell going off. Whoa, I'm triggered. I have to be careful now. Maybe I have to just go outside for five minutes or, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. You understand? Yes, yes. So it's, you know, what you're doing when you go to that place, what we did in the meditation is you familiarize yourself with the potential of the mind and and that means, you know, that's a cultivation and in Pali it's called bhavana. You know, so and the word for which is sometimes used for meditation in in Thailand is they just say bhavana. You know, they they mean cultivation, familiarization, and mm -hmm. in the you know gom gom is called. It's the same thing. The word which is used for meditation is the same bhavana gom in 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 Tibetan. It means mean to get really used to. Mm -hmm how the mind is even if it doesn't want anything mm -hmm. if it from any of the hindrances and then knowing this is the natural mind you know and everything else is when it's off center yeah yeah you don't need to take it so serious you know mm -hmm. but of course it's a long way to go you know because we completely get go under you know with it yeah if you go under often enough with more and more awareness, you know, and then that, uh, you know, the urge to cultivate that knowing, you know, becomes stronger and stronger because we can see the other ways they just don't work, you know. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you for putting it all into the... Yeah. Like, it's like together. Yeah. You know, it's like going to the supermarket and they want to sell you something and they say, Do you want to taste one cookie? You know? So you have mm -hmm. a taste, you know, and then you want more. So you need to get back there. Okay. Mm -hmm. So to get back to those to those experience of, of the knower. Yeah. 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 So to strengthen the, the confidence, you know, that this is something you can do. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because when we're under the influence, you know, we often get afraid that, you know, we get we get afraid and then we are not confident that we have the capacity. And and then the more often we have experienced, the more we can remember it, you know. So it's it's just a, a skill, like learning the piano, learning to drive a car. It's just like that, you know. Mm. Not rocket science. Yeah. Well, I notice it's much easier to to get there with support, like somebody guiding me in meditation or, you know, in a group. I, you know, I would like you, to get there on my own as well at some point. But yeah, that's going to take yeah, some You will, you will, you know, and for now you just be in the beginning, you'll go to a piano teacher, you don't sit down on your own, like on day one, the, the, yeah. sit there for years, things to do. This doesn't, it's just the way it is, you know, we need to first learn. To a certain extent, and then you do sometimes alone, sometimes with a group, and slowly, slowly you become more independent. But it takes time. Mm -hmm. It's a skill. Mm -hmm. Good question. Great, thank you. Thank you for taking time to answer it. Sure.
Well, you know, I'm giving another minute or so. If no more questions come, then I'm going to do a dedication of merit and then hand over to Manori for the closing announcements. Okay, so I'm going to dedicate uh, the, you know, the benefit of our practice today to all of you, to your practice, and also to Aya Chanda during her Vasa retreat at uh, Bodhinyana in uh, Australia. And to my two hosts, Manuri and Matthias, thank you so much for holding the space. May you have every good blessing. May all the devas protect you. By the power of all the Buddhas, may you ever be well. May you have every good blessing. May all the devas protect you. By the power of all the Dhamma, may you ever be well. May you have every good blessing. May all the devas protect you. By the power of all the Sangha, may you ever be well. So thank you so much for coming. And just in case you're interested, I have an online teaching um, every Wednesday from 9 to 10 Pacific time. That would be 6 to 7 um, UK time and 7 to 8 uh, European mainland time. So if you're interested, you could uh, visit you know, the Aloka Earth Room. And while Manuri is making her little announcement, I'm going to put a link into the chat if you are interested. Thank you so much for everything. And all the best for your practice. Thank you. And thank you very much, Aya Santajitta, for your meditation today, mixing the Buddha Nasati and the beautiful way you did the four elements and that um, boundless mind, which was wonderful. And you also gave us the opportunity to discuss question and, uh, and learn from each other by questioning as well.